And we're starting off the list with Nami, Japan. This town in Fukushima Prefecture once housed 20,000 residents, but in one night in March of 2011, the most destructive earthquake in Japanese history hit off the coast. This caused a massive tsunami that hit a nearby power plant. After three meltdowns and widespread nuclear fallout, the residents were forced to evacuate. The town was completely abandoned for a year until April of 2012 when residents were allowed to slowly make their way back in, but only in two designated zones. Zone 3 was completely off limits and still remains so to this very day. There have been many attempts to try and rebuild the town into what it once was. Rents have been reduced. There's even been plans to build a Pokemon themed theme park, but most uh, people just don't want to go anywhere near the place based on the radioactive contamination, which uh, is understandable. Number 9. Kantubek, Uzbekistan. This abandoned town sits on Vazrozdanya Island and was abandoned in 1992 after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. This town was built to house about 1,500 people. Most of its residents were scientists working at a top secret USSR biological weapons testing site. This place became an absolute nightmare following a couple, you know, little accidents that left a number of people infected with smallpox. After a field tests went wrong. Uh, two people ended up dying. Then about a year later, two fishermen were found dead, likely from the bubonic plague that had leaked out of the testing facility. Then antelopes started killing over and dying. Uh, dead fish were being hauled out of the sea in big nets. Uh, the island became a dumping ground for anthrax in the 80s until the lab was finally closed down, with the town becoming deserted by 1992. Apparently there's plans to turn the area into a national park. I I would not go anywhere near this place. In 2002, there was a US led expedition to neutralize the anthrax because uh, they were scared that, like, possible bad people were going to try and get their hands on it. Uh, even still, though, I don't know, just let bygones be bygones. It, radioactive, it's, is it ever fully gone? You know? And at number eight, we have Craco, Italy. Man, this place looks beautiful. Just wanted to start by saying that. There's definitely an eeriness with abandoned towns, but this one has such a majestic quality about it. It doesn't look all depressing and gray like an abandoned city you'd see in Russia or something. So, Craco is a historic hilltop town located in the Basilicata region of southern Italy. Its history dates back to the 8th century when it was founded by the Greeks. The town prospered during the medieval period when its economy based on agriculture and craftsmanship. But in the 20th century, Krako faced a number of issues. In 1963, a landslide forced many residents to abandon their homes and relocate to a nearby valley. There were also earthquakes in 1972 and 1980, which further damaged the town's infrastructure, making it basically uninhabitable. The Italian government declared Krako a ghost town, and the remaining residents were forced to leave due to safety concerns. Today, the town stands as this hauntingly beautiful shell of what it once was. The buildings are crumbling, the streets are empty, at least when tourists aren't visiting. The town's also been used for a filming location for a number of movies, most notably Quantum of Solace. Next on the list is Wittenoom, Australia. This is just a very sad story. So, this town was built in 1947 in Pilbara, Western Australia, housed 20,000 residents, and was bustling with life at one point. They had a movie theater, two schools, a hotel. The parents of most of the families living there, uh, though, worked in the nearby Blue Asbestos Mine. This was a time where people didn't know how harmful asbestos was. By the mid-60s, though, it became a known thing and the mine was shut down and a lot of residents up and left. The thing is, they'd already been exposed to it for so long, over 2,000 of these former residents would go on to die of asbestos-related illnesses. The area has now become known as Australia's Chernobyl. Number six, Pyramiden. Pyramiden in Svalbard, Norway, was once a thriving Soviet coal mining settlement established in 1910 by Sweden. It was later sold to the Soviet Union in 1927. The town's name translates to the Pyramid in various languages, named after the pyramid-shaped mountain nearby. During its peak, 
Pier Maiden housed a significant population. The town's economy relied heavily on coal mining, and it continued to operate under Soviet management until the early 90s. But in 98, Pier Maiden was abruptly abandoned when mining ceased. The residents left behind buildings, possessions, and remnants of this once vibrant community. And today, Pier Maiden stands frozen in time as a ghost town. And the harsh Arctic climate has preserved the town remarkably well. Buildings remain standing, showcasing this Soviet era architecture and interiors and the town's infrastructure, including the swimming pool, school, cultural center, still eerily intact. And at number five, Bannock, Montana. This abandoned town in Beaverhead County, Montana was founded in 1862 after the discovery of gold in Grasshopper Creek. It quickly became a booming mining town, attracting thousands of prospectors and settlers seeking fortune in the gold fields. With the prospect of wealth, though, came a ton of violence and lawlessness. In 1863, the infamous Plummer Gang, led by Henry Plummer, became the town's sheriff, secretly organizing a gang of outlaws who terrorized the area. There were a series of robberies, stagecoach holdups, violent deaths happened as a result. The citizens, fed up with this rampant crime, formed the Vigilance Committee, which eventually captured and hanged over 20 members of this gang, including Plummer, in a single night. Shootouts, barroom brawls, other violent incidents it was just happening all the time here back in the day. It was your classic Wild West town. But as the gold reserves dwindled and new mining opportunities came about in other places, the town's population started to decline. Today, Bannock stands as this well-preserved ghost town with over 60 historic structures remaining, including houses, saloons, and a schoolhouse. Because of its violent history though, some visitors and locals believe the place to be haunted. Numerous ghost stories and paranormal encounters have been reported over the years. Next on the list, we have Frisco in Beaver County, Utah. This was a mining town that boomed in the late 19th century. Established in the 1870s, it was named after the San Francisco Mountains. The miners extracted silver, lead, and zinc from nearby mines. During its heyday, Frisco was notorious for its lawlessness and violence. The town earned a reputation as one of the wildest mining camps in the West. Shootouts, brawls, and other violent things were common. At one point, multiple men would die violently on a nightly basis. I've heard up to 12, which is insane. I don't know if that's true. 12 a night? How would you even have people left after like a month? But anyway, but as the mines were depleted, and economic opportunities started to die down, the town's population began to decline. By the 1920s, the place was mostly abandoned. It's now a complete ghost town with abandoned structures, crumbling homes, and decaying industrial facilities. Number three, Centralia, Pennsylvania. Centralia used to be a lively, you guessed it, coal mining town in Columbia County. Back in the mid 1800s, coal mining really kicked off and the town prospered through the late 19th and early 20th centuries, but trouble began in 1962 when a fire started in the coal mines beneath the town. Nobody knows exactly how it began, but it's believed to have started in a landfill, an abandoned strip mine pit. Efforts to put out the fire failed and it kept burning underground. By the 80s, it became clear the situation was just dire. Carbon monoxide was seeping from the fire. The government stepped in, and in 84, a law was passed to move Centralia's residents. Most buildings were torn down, and people were relocated to nearby towns. Even today, though, like smoke and toxic gases are, continue to rise from the ground. It, it's very apocalyptic looking. In its second place, we have St. Elmo, Colorado. St. Elmo is a ghost town located in Chaffee County, Colorado. Founded in the late 1800s, St. Elmo was once a thriving mining town, mostly focusing on gold and silver mining. There was a general store, hotels, saloons. Over the years, as mining activities started to die down, residents left St. Elmo, and by the 1920s, the town became mostly abandoned. But today, many of its original buildings still stand. This place is a ghost town in more ways than one, though. Annabelle Stark, also known as Dirty Annie, was, was uh, one of the last residents of the town. She lived there with her brother, Tony Stark, who suffered from mental health issues. As the town started to empty, Annabelle and Tony were among the few who still remained, and Tony's mental state deteriorated further due to the isolation and lack of social interaction. He was often seen walking the streets, muttering to himself. Annabelle, caring for her brother, lived 
a reclusive life in their decaying family home, Dirty Annie Stark became something of a local legend, known for her resilience and determination to stay in St. Elmo despite its abandonment. Some reports suggest that Annabelle and Tony were eventually the very last two residents of the town, refusing to leave even when most of the buildings around them were completely empty. Today, this ghost town is said to be haunted by the ghost of Dirty Annie, still roaming the empty streets at night as it's ghostly protector. And finally, we have Ardour sur Glane in France. The 10th of June 1944 was a dark day for the residents of this quiet farming village. SS Major General Heinz Bernhard sent his troops in the Waffen SS Panzer Division to the village in retaliation against French resistance activity in the area. They wanted to send a message, so they destroyed the entire village and pretty much everyone in it. Even people just passing by the area were dragged into the massacre. In the end, only six people managed to escape. These victims were just civilians, mostly being women and children. People were taken to barns where they were down with machine guns. Others were loaded into a church which was set on fire. Anyone attempting to escape through the windows were down. It was about as nightmarish as it gets. And today, what remains of the village still stands, left exactly as it was after the massacre. A haunting reminder of the atrocities that took place on that day. Up first on the list, we have Demon's Alley, a mysterious ghost town in New Jersey. The alley is made up of a handful of abandoned houses located off Route 23 in West Milford. Although there is no official record as to why the homes, which have been around since before anyone can remember, were abandoned in the first place, there are many theories that have speculated the cause. The most popular of which tells the story of a seemingly regular man who moved into the neighborhood, after which strange things began to happen. It appears as though this normal man was actually the leader of a large, very sinister cult. A fact which of course was unbeknownst to his neighbors, who upon receiving an invitation to the man's home, happily obliged. It is said that once all of the members of the neighborhood had finally arrived, they were trapped inside to endure nothing short of a horrific tragedy, as members of the man's cult emerged from the shadows and massacred every last one. Our next town is the infamous Roanoke. And unlike Demon Alley, whose residents disappeared without a trace, the story of Roanoke is just slightly more bizarre as an entire colony, including all of their homes and belongings, are of set to disappear. If you're a horror buff, you might recognize the name from season 6 of American Horror Story, which depicts the town in all its dark and gory glory. But again, that's a TV show, so let's get down to the facts. Roanoke, also known as the town that never was, was located in what's now known as Dare County in North Carolina. There is much more mystery than information surrounding the disappearance, but it is said that John White, an English artist, discovered the town around 1585, after which he returned back to England. In 1590, however, he made his way back to Roanoke to visit the locals whom he'd befriended on his first voyage, but was absolutely shocked when, upon his arrival, he found the town completely abandoned. Even the houses had disappeared, and in their place, a barrier fort was placed. And one word, Croatoan, was carved into a wooden post. Next up we have Pine Point, located in the Northwest Territories in Canada. The small lead and zinc mining town that completely vanished in the 1980s, just 25 years after it was originally established in the 1960s. The town came to be as a result of a joint venture between the Government of Canada and the Comenco Mining Company, and was fully equipped with schools and small town businesses. When the Comenco Mine officially shut its doors in 1988, the town's erasure begun. As buildings were knocked down, residents quickly evacuated until there was nothing left more than the shell of a thing that once was. Now, I can understand Comico deciding to end its involvement in the town. Perhaps the mines ran out of their precious lead or zinc. Perhaps the mines ran out of their precious lead or zinc that had led to the town's creation in the first place. But to begin knocking down buildings and pushing the town into a void of non-existence? Call me a cynic, but I think there's something more to it. Alright, for this next one, we might be veering slightly off the rails, but bear with me as we discuss the United United Kingdom 
of Torrid. Was it a town that vanished, one that never existed at all, or perhaps maybe one that did exist or does exist, but in a universe entirely separate from our own? The story begins in July of 1954 in a Japanese airport when a real man by the name of John Allen Kucher Zergis presented a passport in which the agent at the desk had never seen before. In fact, no one had ever seen it before as the passport had been issued by the United Kingdom of Torrid, which as far as we know doesn't exist. You're probably thinking he was thrown out of the airport and never made his flight, but the strange part is that he had actually just gotten off a flight, his passport having been stamped and checked multiple times before boarding. So what was going on? When questioned, the man insisted that the United Kingdom of Torrid was in fact a real place and demanded someone bring him a map so he could provide some much needed education to the agents. Upon seeing the map, however, he became angry. He pointed to an area on the border between France and Madrid and asked why they would have provided him with a fake map. Police decided it would be best to question the man and so they put him up in a hotel for the night with the hopes of doing so the next day, his room guarded by two officers. However, the next morning, the room was completely empty. The man had vanished along with his passport and any trace of the unknown country. Some people believe this story, the presence of the man and the existence of a legitimate passport issued by what appeared to be a legitimate government is proof of a parallel universe, but what do you guys think? Share it in the comments and I'll take a look. And next on the list, we have Villa Epicuan in Argentina, a small village on a lake just six hours away from the capital. Buenos Aires. The town was created in 1920 when an Englishman saw the land and decided to lease it with the hopes of converting it into a tourist hotspot. He built a resort and paid local scientists to back his claims that the town's lake had healing properties and all of a sudden, business was booming. Argentinian natives flocked to the area for a chance to experience the waters along with many Jewish tourists who had found interest in the lake's uncanny similarity to the Dead Sea. While you might be thinking visitors to the town were unfortunate victims of a tourist trap, the mineral rich lake really did have restorative properties and helped many people with arthritis, skin conditions, and even diabetes. The good fortune did eventually come to an end, however, when in 1985, it started to rain and rain and rain some more. So much so that water levels began to rise at a rate of one centimeter per hour. And by the end of it all, after two weeks of heavy rainfall and a broken dam, the water was three meters deep and the town was evacuated. It seems that all the water had given it had also swiftly taken away. The town remained empty even after the water level subsided many years later, except for Pablo Novak, aged 39, who was born in the town and who remains to this day living in solitude in the ghost of a town that once was. Next on the list, we have Varosha Famagusta on the island of Cyprus. Once a booming tourist town, the area is now nothing more than memories and ruins. In the late 1960s, the town had an estimated population of 60,000 individuals, a number which rose significantly significantly in the high season to 100,000 people staying in the town. So what happened to it? Well, in 1974, Turkey invaded the island country, causing citywide evacuations. The town was left abandoned and frozen in time, as occupants of the area had to flee quickly, leaving behind all of their belongings as if they had just run out to the store, expecting to be back home in no less than 20 minutes. After the attack, however, the town was fenced off from the rest of the island and no one was allowed to return, not even to retrieve items left behind. Because of this, the town still stands today, deserted and eerie, a snapshot in time, untouched for over 50 years. And next we have Hashima, Japan, also known as Battleship Island. So not just a town, but an entire island that became nothing more than a ghost town. The island was discovered about nine miles, 15 kilometers away from the city of Nagasaki. And in 1810, coal was discovered there, an incredibly valuable resource at the time. In 1887, the island was converted into a mining facility inhabited by over 5,000 individuals, but that didn't last long as in 1974, petroleum was becoming the preferred power product, and so with coal becoming assumingly obsolete, the mining facility was shut down. Because the mine was the island's only source of infrastructure, its foreclosure led to the departure of the entirety of the town's inhabitants. Today, the island, with its grey buildings and concrete moat, stands abandoned in the sea, closely resembling some kind of island battleship hybrid, hence its fitting nickname, 
Battleship Island. And finally, because I appreciate you all so much, we've got a three for one. The disappearance of Louisiana towns Ruddock, Wangram, and Frenier in 1915. The trio, located on the southwest edge of Lake Ponchard Train, were major hotspots of immigration for German cabbage farmers, if you can believe it. The towns met their end on September 19th when a massive hurricane moved in from the Caribbean with surges of 13 feet and 125 mile per hour winds. On that day, the towns were completely washed away and over 300 lives were lost. While this is tragic, it's also scientifically explainable. But what isn't is the way that the storm and the many fatalities had been foretold. Records of the town corresponding with records of voodoo priestesses recall a woman by the name of Julia Brown, who served as a local healer. She was also quite the entertainer, spending her evenings sitting on her front porch playing her guitar and singing made up songs. But as she neared the end of her life, things began to take a sinister turn. Songs which once illustrated beauty and joy had been replaced by a tune of warning, as the woman sang that one day she would die and everything would die with her. Eventually, Julia did pass and her funeral was held on October 2nd of 1915, the very day the storm rolled into town. Off our list, and at number 10, we have Pripyat, Ukraine, which was the city most affected by the Chernobyl nuclear disaster in 1986, an infamous incident that released a massive amount of radiation out into the world. The accident forced entire towns to abruptly empty out, and the area within a 19 mile radius of the plant was deemed uninhabitable. For at least another 180 years, absolutely insane. There are a ton of spooky photo ops but the most famous is the decaying amusement parks. I mean, talk about creepy. How to visit the Chernobyl region is about two hours away, and tours range from private visits to multi-day itineraries. I don't know about you guys, but I'm pretty sure one day is enough for my itinerary. <laughs> I don't need an itinerary because I'll remember what I'm doing, and it's only lasting one day. At number four, we have Thamestown, Shanghai, China. China is a big fan of a replica cities. In fact, Shanghai has seven European-themed towns built to give wealthy residents a new place to call home. There's a Dutch-inspired canal-lined neighborhood, a Paris replica completed with a 300-foot Eiffel Tower, and even a slice of Sweden-inspired churches and Nordic houses included. But we're particularly fans of the Thames Town, a British coffee catch is 40 minutes from downtown Shanghai. Here you'll find a scale replica of the Christ Church, statue of Shakespeare and Winston Churchill, and even some familiar a red telephone booth scattered here and there. As curiously cute as this mini city sounds on paper, well, it ended up being a complete failure. In fact, all of the seven experimental towns are now pretty much abandoned. Well, how do you visit? Well, travelers are more than welcome to walk the cobblestone streets of all seven replica cities. To get to the Thames town, they recommend taking the Shanghai Metro 9 to the Song Jing Zing Shing station. And because I'm pronouncing those words absolutely absolutely correct. You guys won't get lost. And then, if you make it to the station that I just said, you can take a taxi for the rest of the way. Only about 2.5 miles away and about $2 USD. Finally down, in at number three, for abandoned towns you shouldn't visit, we're talking about the Great Salt Tower, Utah. And if you find yourself in Salt Lake City, Utah, you'll probably hear about the Great Salt Lake or uh, the Dead Sea of America where you can float on the water. Now, I must tell you that you'll encounter corpses of dead seagulls swarming flies and a putrid odor. If you take the plunge, there's no way to miss the cell tire, a huge building with Moorish domes that you can see at the same time when you can smell the stench. The salt tire that you see now is actually the third one. The first one was built in 1893 in order to provide a safe venue for recreation for families. It became immensely popular with all kinds of events until its pavilion and few other buildings were ravaged by the fire in 1925. Although it was built a second time, it never achieved the same popularity. In a period marked by the Great Depression, World War II, and several mishaps, it finally got destroyed in an arson fire in 1970. The third one was built in 1981, approximately a mile away from the original venue. But you kind of take away the whole history of it, so I can see why it never became as popular. Now, number two on this list, we have Silver City, Idaho, which was at one point one of the largest cities in Idaho. So just imagine one of the largest cities being abandoned. Imagine where I live in Toronto, I'm going out my door, and it's like, where did everybody go? 
Well, the town was established in the mid 1800s during the, well, you guys guessed it, the gold and silver rush of the Western United States. By the 1880s, the town's population rose to 2,500 people. At its height in the 1880s, it was a gold and silver mining town with a population of around 2,500 and it had approximately 75 businesses. As mining in the area began to die down, so did the city. In 1942, the last mine in the area was closed. Well, you can still visit Silver City, which currently has around 70 buildings, including old churches, a hotel, and it has a lot of old homes that you can see. Starting off our list today, we have Athens, Texas, home to Reverend Fuller, who it seems took a dark turn the day the circus rolled into town. It is said that on that day, a wagon carrying a cargo of monkeys tipped over and the animals escaped into the woods, where some were later captured by Reverend Fuller. Local tell that Fuller kept the monkeys in a cage on a plot of land he owned called Fuller Park, where eventually he began using them for highly unethical experimentation. It was said for years he tore the animals until they eventually died and were buried on the land. Later, when Fuller passed, he and his wife were buried in the park as well. Many locals who had heard the rumors of Fuller's heinous acts went out to explore the land driven by curiosity. Many also recounted that while exploring the area, they had found a series of entrances to underground tunnels, all of which eventually met up underground, forming the shape of a pentagram. It has also been said that the road leading into the park and the park itself, where the monkeys along with Fuller and his wife are buried is extremely haunted. Not by Fuller's ghost, but rather the ghost of the monkeys who had to endure the unforgiving nature of Fuller's torture under the guise of scientific exploration. Next, we have the tragedy of McCarthy, Alaska, an event that took place in 1983 in which a man named Hastings had planned to wipe out the entire population of the small town. About eight months prior to the incident, Hastings had moved to the small mining town that had a population of just 22 people. On February 29th, Hastings went over to his friend Chris Richards' home and fired two projectiles at the man. One hit him just above his eye and the other in the neck. Richards was, however, However, able to escape after defending himself with a kitchen blade and ran to get help. After firing at Richards, Hastings went to the airstrip where most of the town had gathered, awaiting the weekly mail delivery. He hit seven individuals with projectiles from a handheld weapon. Six passed and one suffered severe injury. When Hastings was eventually apprehended, 30 kilometers outside of the town, he admitted that he had planned on taking out the entire population but was ultimately unsuccessful. He had also wanted to hijack the mail plane so that he could fly to Glen Allen where he would steal a truck and blow himself up along with the Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline Pump Station. Hastings was sentenced to 634 years in prison for his crimes. Next on our list today, we have San Geronimo de Juarez, Mexico, a town with a population of just 7,300 in which Oscar Flores took the lives of 12 individuals, including a member of his own family. The incident started in the man's home where he ended the life of his nephew with a kitchen blade. When police arrived on the scene, Flores was able to escape after he beat one officer with a large rock and stole the weapon off another. Flores then used that weapon to continue his violent rampage, firing at random people throughout the town. Eventually, the townspeople turned on Flores and began chasing him. While trying to outrun them, Flores lost the weapon he had stolen and somehow also lost his clothes. He faced off against the townspeople naked, armed with only a large blade, but when police arrived at the scene, they were able to successfully apprehend Flores, who was badly injured in the process and died in hospital not long after. After his death, it was discovered that seven years prior to his final violent spree, Flores, who had a long history of substance abuse, had taken the life of his brother-in-law, as well as five other individuals in Tijuana in the years prior. Next up, we have the 10 hour killing spree that took place in June of 2010 in the small villages of Cumbria in England. It all started early in the morning when 56 year old taxi driver Derek Bird drove to his brother's home and fired 11 projectiles into his head using a handheld weapon. He then drove to the home of his family's tax agent who he thought had been conspiring against him alongside his brother and took the man's life in a similar fashion. After the incident, it seems as though Bird just snapped. He began driving through the villages and towns targeting fellow cattle Cab drivers. One died and three were injured before the police caught wind. Somehow, however, Bird was able to avoid capture. He ditched the cops and continued driving to the next town where again he began firing at random people, ending the lives of another nine men and women and injuring another seven. Eventually, out of gas and out of ammo, missing his vehicle's front tire, Bird got out of his car and began walking into the woods. An hour later, police located his body and it was determined that the man, unable to 
live with his actions or perhaps face the consequences, had taken his own life. Next up on our list today, we have the small town of Luxeuil, located in France and home to just 130 residents. In 1989, it was resident Christian Dornier who landed the town on this list after a mental break led him to a two hour killing spree in which he ended the lives of 14 individuals. While the reality of the incident was shocking, after the event took place, many of the locals admitted to having suspected such behavior was inevitable from Dornier. In fact, before the killings even took place, the town's council had suggested to Dornier's family that he should seek psychological help for his disposition. Unfortunately, the family did not listen to the council and on July 12th, Dornier fired a handheld weapon at his sister and then opened fire on his mother and father. Dornier then got in his car where he spent the next two hours driving around town, firing his weapon at anyone who crossed his path. He was eventually caught by police after sustaining an injury from an officer's weapon. Dornier did survive the arrest and went to trial, but he was never convicted for his crimes. He was found not guilty by reason of insanity. In 1991, Dornier was checked into a psychiatric hospital in France where he remains to this day. Next up, we have the small town of Hungford, England, population 5,000. On August 10th of 1984, yet another two hour killing spree occurred that caused the deaths of seven 17 individuals, including the assailant's family dog, and it also badly injured 15 more. The killing started around 12 p.m. when Michael Robert Ryan abducted a woman from a local park, took her to a secluded area, and fired 13 projectiles at her, ending her life. Michael then fled the scene and made his way back to his neighborhood. When he arrived at his home, he ended the life of the family dog with a projectile and then began loading up his car with handheld weapons. He tried to leave, but his car wouldn't start, so out of anger, he grabbed a can of gasoline, soaked the house, and set it on fire. He then began walking down the road, aiming at anyone he saw. When his mother arrived on the scene, she yelled out to her son, begging him to stop and asking why he was doing what he was doing. He took her life and then fled the area. He eventually took his own life in an empty building that had been surrounded by law enforcement after Michael had been spotted inside. The incident changed the history of England, as shortly after this took place, the country implemented much stricter weapons laws. Next on our list today, we have the unsolved mystery of the Bedford, Massachusetts highway killings. In March of 1988, in the small town, which now has a population of around 13,000, young women started to go missing. The disappearances went on for months, but no one could figure out why they were happening. It wasn't until July of that same year that some clarity began to take place, when the bodies of 9 out of the 11 missing women were discovered along the town's highway. It was revealed that the women who had lost their lives all had ties to illegal substance distribution as well as SEX work. Authorities determined that foul play had led to the deaths and a case was opened in the hopes of locating the remaining two missing women and apprehending the killer or killers involved in the deaths of the discovered nine. Unfortunately, neither were ever found and to this day, the case remains an unsolved mystery that continues to baffle law enforcement and plague the small town of Bedford, Massachusetts. Next up and starting off our top three today, we have the small town of Burke Canyon, in Idaho. The town was founded in 1887 after rich deposits of silver and lead had been discovered in the area. The architecture of the town was strange, as it had to accommodate the fact that the town had been built inside an incredibly thin canyon, which at some points was only 300 feet wide. But they made it work. For a while, at least, as just a few years after the town opened its doors, it became devastated by an avalanche, which was quickly followed up by a labor strike. A labor strike that ended in a standoff between the miners and the mine owners, during which a projectile accidentally set off a large amount of dynamite, which caused a mill to explode and ended the lives of six people. A few years later, disgruntled miners deliberately blew up another mill, claiming the lives of even more. The incident were followed up by two massive natural fires, a major flood, and another large avalanche, causing the fall of Burke Canyon, which is known today as nothing much more than a ghost town with some odd buildings and a very violent past. Next up, we have Attica, New York. If the town sounds familiar, it might be because you are vaguely remembering stories you've heard about the town's prison with the same name, which, of course, is what landed the small town on today's list in the first place. The Attica Maximum Security Prison was home to many of the world's most infamous 
infamous criminals, including American killer David Berkowitz, also known as the Son of Sam, who was responsible for at least eight deaths after which he consumed the flesh of his victims, and Mark David Chapman, the man who killed Beatles legend John Lennon. In 1971, the inmates of the prison, which had been known for its inhumane treatment of the prisoners, took control in an effort to negotiate for better living conditions. The state responded with extreme force, leading to the deaths of at least 34 inmates and nine hostages. Okay, this last town is Baltimore, Maryland, and while it's not small, what happened there is definitely shocking. Have you ever heard of Joe Menthe? Well, if you haven't, listen up, and if you're eating, put it down. Joe Menthe was an American serial killer who claimed to have been responsible for violating and ending the lives of 13 separate individuals. If right now you're wondering what he did with the bodies of the deceased, I will tell you, but I'm not happy about it. He made them into burgers and served those burgers to members of the public at his roadside open pit barbecue stand. He was arrested after he asked a friend to help him dispose of a body he had been hiding in a warehouse for over a month. The friend obviously reported him to the police and Joe was convicted of two killings despite confessing to 13. However, research did later confirm three more of his victims. Joe was sentenced to life without parole, thank God, and eventually died in his cell on August 5th of 2017 at the age of 62. To start off our list today, we are going to take a deep dive into Dudley Town, Connecticut, also known as the town that never existed or the village of the damned. The town was settled in the 1740s and thrived for a while before falling victim to disease, crop failure, and mysterious unexplained death, which began taking place shortly after the Dudley family came to visit. Many villagers believe that the family had arrived with a curse brought from England to damn the residents of the town. So shortly after the misfortune started, Dudley Town's abandonment began as many villagers fled for their lives in fear, which was a pretty good call, I guess, because it is said that those who stayed began to slowly descend into the realm of insanity, one by one, with many claiming to have witnessed strange creatures emerging from the forest surrounding the town. Those who enter that same forest today tell of a deafening silence that feels eerily thick and almost suffocating. Reports of aggressive animals along the town's hiking trails, desperate screams coming from the treetops, and the fact that many people and pets have mysteriously gone missing in the area over the years might be a few reasons why the town remains abandoned and illegal to enter to this day, which honestly just makes me wonder what other secrets might be hiding within its historically dark parameters. All right, next up we have La Noria in Chile. Now, when I describe this place, it's gonna sound like I'm exaggerating, but I'm really not. There are tons of videos of people exploring this ghost town, and it looks exactly what it sounds like when described. An incredibly creepy abandoned town with bones, some human, a lot human, scattered around the place. Open coffins, crosses everywhere. It's really Really quite the vibe. This place sits in the Atacama Desert. It was once a bustling mining town, but when the mines dried up, the people started new lives, but their dead were left behind. And as the years went on, people would come to this place and loot it. Even coffins would be opened up and items like jewelry they'd been buried with would be stolen. So tons of graves now sit out in the open with the bones of the dead still sitting inside of them. So it probably comes as no surprise that people will claim to see some unexplained things going on here, especially at night, shadowy figures or even just full bodied apparitions. And of course, the haunting sounds of the angered spirits are said to echo through the night as well. Alrighty, next up we have an ancient town with some pretty sadistic sacrificial rituals. Well, not so much a town as a temple in a town, specifically the Moch Temple located in the northwest of Peru. The temple thrived between 100 and 800 AD. The people of the town were known for producing sophisticated goods for their time, including hand-painted pottery made from molds. They also were incredibly advanced when it came to gold working, monument construction, and city planning. While at one time, the town was well known for their advancements, including their incredibly efficient irrigation systems, in 1995, they became known for something a bit different. You see, archeologists discovered a huge sacrificial grave site near the temple filled with the bodies of male sacrificial victims who likely did not go willingly. As it is believed, many of them were travelers who met their unfortunate ends while crossing the Mochi land in search 
of their final destinations. Murals on the walls of the temple illustrate the men's final moments, showing them naked and hogtied before being slaughtered. After which the men's skulls were turned into cups used to collect the BLOOD of the deceased so that it may be offered up as a gift to the gods. Super gross. Next, we head over to China to discuss Kowloon Walled City. Unlike pretty much every spot on this list, I think this place would have actually been uh, much scarier before it was abandoned. The Kowloon Walled City was this crazy, super dense, and sort of chaotic place in Hong Kong. Picture a bunch of cramped, towering buildings all squished together, a giant concrete jungle. Back in the Song Dynasty around 960 to 1279 AD, there was this cool walled garrison in Kowloon. Over time, it got kind of abandoned, and during the British colonial period, nobody really bothered about it. People just started building random structures within its walls. Fast forward to the 20th century, and it turned into this insane unplanned mega city within a city. The buildings were like a tangled mess of staircases, pipes, and wires. It became famous for being overcrowded, and it was also basically lawless. The only ones really governing the place were the triads. It was tons of crime, and it was very dark. Because of how dense the place was, it was hard for natural light to even reach the lower levels of the city, so people had to go to the roofs of their buildings to get any light. Eventually, in the 90s, the Hong Kong government decided the place needed to go and demolition began in March of 1993. Today though, some of the ruins still remain. Next up we've got the Bangar Fort located in Rajasthan, India. The small town was built in the 17th century by an emperor named Madho Singh as a testament of love to his son, Man Singh. At its peak, the town was home to over 10,000 people. Today, living in the town is prohibited. And while while tourists and locals may visit the ruins during the day, they are strictly banned from entering the area before sunrise and after sunset. And this is because of the fact that since Bangar Fort's re-establishment as an unaltered landmark in the 21st century, people who have entered the premises during these times have often heard or seen dark spirits. And those who have gone into the forts have either turned up dead or just not turned up at all. Because of this, each night before the sun sets, the forts and the grounds are evacuated, locked, and guarded. This is also why the area has earned the title of most haunted place in India. Many believe the haunting is due to a curse placed on the town during its peak by hermit Baba Baloo, who was living in the area at the time. Shortly after he declared his curse, a devastating earthquake hit the town, causing its people, along with the people from 83 surrounding villages, to vanish overnight. Next on the list is Poveglia Island in Italy. This place has a rather ominous nickname, Ghost Island and that's not just because nobody lives there. This island is basically a mix of a former hospital and a big giant graveyard. So back in the day during the bubonic plague in the 1700s, which was a very fun time, they used Paveglia as a quarantine spot. It was the place you'd get dumped when you were really sick. And then later on, they built a mental hospital there. So it went from a plague quarantine spot, pretty dark already, to a place where even more horrible things happened because mental hospitals were never pleasant, and the inmates were never treated well. The hospital eventually closed in the 60s, and the island's been abandoned ever since. So many people died on this island that half of the soil is apparently made up of their remains, which is just wild. Today, the island is completely off limits because for some reason, people need to be told not to go to a place like this. Next up, we've got Kaldara, yet another town in Rajasthan, India, with a pretty sordid past. It is said that around 300 years ago, Kaldara was quite a prosperous village where townsfolk lived happily and, despite the area's dry agriculture, were able to grow incredibly abundant crops throughout the years. It wasn't until the arrival of a debaucherous Prime Minister, Salem Singh, that things started to go downhill. When Salem arrived in the town, he set his sights on a beautiful young woman. He claimed he would marry her by any means necessary, including force. He warned the villagers that any attempt to protect the girl and thwart the marriage would result in grave consequences for their lands. And so, the villagers basically said screw it. The entire population of the town, including the young woman that Salim had hoped to marry, left Kaldara. But not before they put a dark curse on its barren lands, ensuring that Salim would never be able to reap the ill 
ill-earned rewards of what the villagers had sown. To this date, the small town of Kaldara remains abandoned, in almost the same state it had been left in so many years ago, minus the fruitful harvests, of course. Those who have visited the ancient grounds have told of dark forces that they feel are determined to protect the uninhabitable status of the area, as per the villagers' curse, which had been designed so that no one would ever be able to settle in the area again. Next on the list, we have the largest contaminated site in the southern hemisphere, Wittenoom, in western Australia. This town was surrounded by asbestos mines. There were rich asbestos deposits in the surrounding hills, and back in the day, asbestos was in high demand, being used in construction as a fire resistant and for insulation. So the town grew pretty rapidly as miners and their families settled in the area. Wittenoom was a bumping community. There were schools, shops, a movie theater, but as the years went on and concerns about the health risks associated with asbestos exposure began to be a thing, it became pretty obvious that people were living in a death trap. By the 60s and 70s, the health hazards of asbestos became a well-known thing and the demand for it really dried up. The Wittenoom mine closed in 1966, which had pretty much been the sole source of income for the town. And on top of that, the negative health effects were starting to become pretty apparent. By the 2000s, the town had officially been shut down and only a handful of holdouts remained. But as of 2022, there's no one left and in 2023, the place started getting demolished completely. Okay, next on our list today, we have Cinco Saltos, an Argentinian town with a pretty dark past, obviously. The area in which the town resides receives very little sunlight, providing it with a quite fittingly dark and gloomy aura year round. On many occasions, Cinco Saltos has been referred to as the city of witches, this being largely due to the fact that historically, many residents of the area had been dedicated practitioners of black magic, namely, necromancy and witchcraft. It is said that in ancient times, witches would often perform occult rituals in the town. One of the more commonly performed was a ritualistic sacrifice of young men and women on the Pellegrini Lake that ran through the center of the town. It is said that to this day, anyone who stands near the lake at night comes to know the disembodied screams of the many victims said to have lost their lives by the river so long ago. All right, we're starting off the list with Inunaki Village. Uh, if you want a truly evil town, uh, this is it. Inunaki is said to be this hidden village in a forest in Fukuoka Prefecture. There are only a small handful of residents in Inunaki, and they're not friendly. These are people who choose to go against the principles of Japanese culture. Anyone who's unfortunate enough to find themselves even just in the vicinity of Inunaki may be dragged in only to be met with the violent, sadistic people who live there. One story goes that in the early 70s, a couple car broke down. They ventured further up the forest, hoping to find help, but they came across a small, empty town. It looked totally abandoned. Then, out of one of the homes, stepped this disheveled, crazy-eyed old man who told the couple they were in the village of Inunaki. Then he chopped them up with a sickle. So yes, Inunaki village is an urban legend, but with every urban legend, there is a nugget of truth. And the legend of Inunaki village really started with the old Inunaki tunnel. This tunnel, built in 1949, has a history so dark that it's now completely sealed off. A number of violent crimes and deaths have happened at the tunnel to the point where stories began to spread that there was this evil village beyond it. And even though it's all sealed off now, there are also plenty of stories of the place being very, very haunted. Tucked away and forgotten by time, Ikigo Middlegate has quite the story to tell, straddling a line between a grim past and its very current eerie persona. A spot that once echoed with the despair of World War II concentration camps has now transformed into this intriguing albeit slightly spooky, abandoned site. Located in a U.S. Navy housing area campground in Zushi City, the middle gate to this campground is said to have been a Japanese ammunition depot, but also a place where prisoners of war were held and executed or worked to death. Guards of the Middle Gate have reported seeing legless Japanese soldiers in World War II era uniforms, as well as hearing the classic disembodied voices and footsteps. It's always the footsteps that get me. I don't like it. This history is certainly grim enough to make this place one that has countless tales of hauntings and ghostly visits, but the history of this area 
does not stop here. In fact, it is said that the area surrounding Aikigo also happens to be the resting place of around 50 Yagura, or ancient burial tombs. The tombs were built into the sides of cliffs and date all the way back to the 16th and 17th centuries. Legend also has it that this area was a battlefield for groups of samurai in the 14th century where many people lost their heads, all right? All in all, this makes a lot of sense why this place has countless terrifying stories surrounding it. A bunch of nearly headless nicks walking around. Milady. Next on the list we have Nichitsu, which is usually referred to as Nichitsu Ghost Town. And that's not just because it's completely abandoned either. Apparently you can still find some ghostly residents lingering around this place. Nichitsu was a tin mining town. The workers and their families had to live on site because it's a pretty good clip away from surrounding cities. At some time in the 80s though, everyone up and left, and it's not entirely known why. With most mining towns, there's, there's always a possibility that the mines just dry up. Usually there's an economic factor, but whatever the reason was, the ghost town is said to be haunted. There's a doctor's office in the abandoned hospital that still has the remains of human organs. There's also a jar with a human brain that was there for a while, but someone stole that. Anyway, the place looks like it would be a pretty cool area to explore. Let's take a jaunt into the eerie folds of Japan's past, right into the heart of Orian Buchi. All right, I tried to look it up. It's not as easy to look up as you think it is, okay? So just politely let me know how to pronounce it in the comments if I got it wrong. Keyword being polite. This place isn't your average historical site. It's steeped in tales of sorrow and the supernatural. Here, the air is thick with the legend of courtesans whose lives took a tragic turn, leaving behind a legacy that's as somber as it is mysterious. The legends behind this place go back to the Warring States period. This was a period between the 15th and 16th century where there were almost constant civil wars and upheavals seen in Japan. During this time, this site had a gold mine. Of course, this meant that quite a few people were in the area because of this mine, and there were also courtesans who came here in order to give their services to the men working the mine. Unfortunately, in an attempt to keep the secret of the gold from getting out, it is said that those working the mines took the lives of the 55 courtesans in the area. Since this dark moment in history, there have been countless haunting tales from this area. It is said that the hauntings most often come at night, and people have expressed hearing mostly the screams and cries of the women who are said to haunt the area. So, are you up for a visit? This place sounds pretty horrifying. James, are you going to go there? <laughs> yeah, probably. Next on the list, we have Yokai Village. This small village in the Tokushima prefecture has a history full of tales of yokai. If you don't know what yokai are, they're basically the demons and spirits of Japanese folklore. This village once had a good number of residents, about 15,000, but the story goes that villagers started having encounters with what they could only describe as yokai, and at some point in the 50s, a ton of people just packed their bags and started leaving town because there were demons about, which is understandable. This village was the birthplace of a lot of yokai legends, including the Kanokai Jiji, which is a type of yokai resembling a short old man who is constantly weeping. And when passersby try to comfort what looks like a small crying old man, it then latches onto them, and with the victim unable to break free from this small old man's grasp, because he's not an old man, he's a demon, the yokai then increases its weight until the poor person is just crushed to death. They've started embracing the spirits and demons said to reside there and now hold yokai festivals and have put up tons of yokai statues. It looks like a really cool place. Just a hop, skip, and a jump away from the tranquil sanctity of Nikos Tashugo Shrine, there lies an altogether different realm. A ghostly echo of Americana right in the heart of Japan. 
Welcome to the Western Village, a theme park that once throbbed with the sounds of cowboy boots and saloon piano, inspired by the wild frontiers of classic westerns and the dystopian allure of Westworld. Imagine stepping into 1973, the year this very peculiar park sprang to life, a place where the Wild West met the Far East, brimming with gunslingers, saloons, and a replica of Mount Rushmore. But fast forward to 2000. 2007 and the tumbleweeds began to roll. The park closed its doors, leaving behind a tableau frozen in time, an eerie tableau that whispers tales of yesteryear to those who dare to visit. Today, the Western Village stands as a hauntingly beautiful paradox, a place where time seems to stand still amidst the decay. Urban explorers, those modern day adventurers, flock here, drawn by the irresistible allure of its desolation and the uncanny presence of its robotic inhabitants. And we're heading back to Tokushima Prefecture once again to discuss Nagoro. So this remote village has had a steadily declining population over the years. There were never a ton of residents, but more and more people started leaving to look for better employment opportunities. The old folks passed away, that's just what they do, and by 2019 the village that at one time had 300 plus people now only had about 27. So the place is basically a ghost town, but unlike other abandoned towns you'll come across, this one has become pretty well known for all the life-size dolls scattered throughout the streets and buildings. Tsukimi Ayano, a woman who had left the village when she was young and then came back about 20 years ago to care for her father, decided she wanted to make the place feel more lively, so she started creating all these dolls. And today, there are over 350 dolls placed throughout the village. Definitely gives the place a strange vibe. On one hand, there's this tranquil beauty to it, just quiet and pleasant. But on the other hand, there is an underlying sadness about it, kind of like uh, in I Am Legend, where Will Smith puts up a bunch of mannequins and he starts yelling at them because they won't respond to him. That is a sad scene. What about the Osari Zawa mine? <laughs> <laughs> Tucked away in the verdant depths of the Akita prefecture lies this ghostly vestige of industrial ambition. Once a thriving hub of copper extraction, this mine's veins pulsed with the lifeblood of progress until the mid 20th century. Yet, all mines have their final days, and for Osari Zawa, the echoes of activity have long since faded into an eerie silence. Now, imagine wandering through the abandoned town that once buzzed with the hopes and hard work of its inhabitants. Streets where laughter and chatter once filled the air are now corridors of quiet, bordered by the crumbling relics of homes and communal spaces. There's the desolate school, standing forlorn, its empty classrooms whispering tales of generations who learned and played within its walls, now surrendered to the relentless march of nature. But it's not just about what's gone, it's about what's left behind. The mine and its ghost town are shrouded in mystery that tugs at the curious and the brave. What stories are etched into the fading walls? What secrets do these silent shafts hold? Next on the list is Nara Dreamland. Now, unfortunately, this place has now been demolished, but for a long time it sat completely abandoned, and urban explorers would share some rather creepy stories about the place, but I'll get to that in a minute. So Nara Dreamland was a theme park in Nara, the capital city of Nara Prefecture. It opened in 1961 and was around for years before finally closing in 2006. It couldn't afford to stay open because of low attendance. The place was huge, pretty much the size of a small village, and it just sat there out of use for like 10 years. There's something I find so especially eerie and sad about abandoned theme parks. I mean, these are places that are literally built to be filled with people. Everything is made to be an overload to the senses. Larger than life cartoony statues are all over the place. The signs are all vibrant and colorful. You're supposed to walk through a theme park hearing laughter and screaming and the sounds of large rides zipping along the tracks. So when these places are empty and worn down, left for nature to slowly creep in and reclaim them. It's just the polar opposite of what the place was originally intended for, and I think that just unsettles us. And it doesn't help that urban explorers would claim to hear strange sounds near the park's boats or see strange shadowy figures poking out of corners. 
Dive with me into the eerie silence of Yodo Harbor, where whispers of the past mingle with the murmurs of rebuilding. A once thriving port bustling with life, suddenly silenced by nature's wrath in 2011. The Tohoku earthquake and tsunami didn't just shake the ground, they shook the very soul of this place, leaving behind a ghost town where echoes of lost lives linger in the air. Now, when you stroll through Yodo Harbor, you're walking a tightrope between two worlds, the tangible buzz of reconstruction and the shadowy quiet of areas frozen in time. These neglected corners, untouched and forsaken, aren't just empty. They're charged with the stories of what was. It's as if the town itself is caught in a haunting limbo, struggling to whisper its secrets to those who dare to listen. So, if you're drawn to places where history and mystery intertwine, where every stone and silent building might hold a hidden narrative, then Yodo Harbor beckons. It's a testament to the unpredictable nature of creation and destruction, and a haunting reminder that even in our absence, stories endure waiting to be unearthed. Next up, we have Lenoria in Chile. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, this place was a buzzing salt pepper mining town filled with life in industry. But as time went on, the demand for salt pepper declined, and by the mid 20th century, Lenoria was left abandoned. Now, when you visit Lenoria, you'll find it frozen in time. The town's buildings have decayed, though, but what makes this ghost town especially creepy is all the bones. More on that in a minute. Walking through the deserted streets, you can't escape the feeling of stepping back in time when Lenoria was a thriving hub of activity. The place is also very isolated. It's the, in the middle of the desert, so that definitely adds another layer of spookiness to the place. But as stated before, for one of the most haunting aspects of this place is the old cemetery and all the damn human bones. Here you'll find open coffins, some still housing human remains. Over the years, the ghost town was looted, so bones are scattered everywhere, pretty unsettling. It's said that you should never wander to this town at night as the tortured souls of the dead arise from their graves and wander about. Number five, Mount Sinabung, Indonesia. Mount Sinabung in Indonesia. This is something that is still ongoing. It's a series of volcanic eruptions that have led to the evacuation of villages in the surrounding area of the volcano. Mount Sinabung, located in North Sumatra, has been active for centuries, but in recent years, it's become particularly volatile, and the eruptions have posed a significant threat to the communities living in the vicinity of it. When Sinabung starts to rumble and spew ash and lava, local authorities kick into action. They closely monitor the volcano's activity and issue evacuation orders when necessary to ensure the safety of the residents. And these orders are not taken lightly as volcanic eruptions can be unpredictable and deadly. The process of evacuating towns and villages near the volcano is pretty challenging. Families leave their homes behind, their possessions, and sometimes even their livelihoods. Temporary shelters are set up to provide a safe haven for those displaced by the eruptions, and these shelters offer basic necessities like food and water, medical assistance, but the evacuations are not only a physical upheaval, but also an emotional one. As you can imagine, families are forced to leave behind their ancestral lands and the life they've known for generations. At our number three spot, let me take you to Ruby, Arizona. It's a real gem in the desert. Wish I could say that pun was not intended, but it was. Back in the early 20th century, this place was buzzing with life, all thanks to the copper mining boom. It was a kind of town where everybody knew everybody and things were looking pretty good. But as they say, what goes up must come down. And the copper boom fizzled out. And by the mid 1900s, Ruby was nothing more than a ghost town. The folks moved on and what they left behind is a piece of history stuck in time. Those that wander around Ruby today feel like they're stepping into a time capsule. There are houses, a school, a general store, all just sitting there as if the residents were there one second and gone the very next. A slice of life from another era preserved in the desert. What 
what makes Ruby even cooler is its remote location. You're out there in the rugged desert and you can't help but feel a sense of isolation. As you can imagine, I've never been. That's probably why it's a magnet though for history buffs and, and folks who love exploring the past. Starting off our list today, we have the small town of Fairfax, Virginia, with a population of 24,000 people and one bunny man. No, I'm not talking about some strange, unethical scientific experiment that broke the laws of both nature and the law and created some kind of bunny human hybrid situation. What I'm actually talking about is just a bit more grounded in reality. You see, what happened was in the early 1900s, an asylum in the town shut down after local residents caused an uproar over the amount of patients housed at the asylum, as well as its close proximity to their homes. The asylum complied with the wishes of the public by shutting its doors and sending its patients to live out the rest of their days elsewhere, more specifically, Lorton prison. On their way out of town, however, the bus carrying the now prisoners swerved and crashed by Fairfax Bridge and the then patients, now inmates, escaped. All were eventually located except one a patient named Douglas Griffin. And soon after the crash, police began finding skinned, half-eaten rabbits hung up along the bridge. It is also said that one night, a group of young people went out to explore the area and ended up meeting the same fate as the bunnies. Douglas was never found, and in 1970, almost 60 years after the bus crash, many people reported seeing a man in a white suit with bunny ears carrying a very sharp blade. Was it Douglas? A hoax? Or 60 years later, was is it some kind of copycat killer? Next up, we have Quitman, Arkansas. Apparently, y'all got a dog boy you gotta deal with out there. The story begins with a home built in 1890. Few different families lived there before the Bettises moved in. They were a family of three, Floyd and Aileen Bettis and their son, Gerald. Gerald was an absolute terror, especially to animals. Stories began to circulate about Gerald roaming the streets, gathering up stray cats and dogs, which he'd then torment to death. And he grew up to treat his own parents just as badly, keeping them locked away in the attic and even throwing his own father down the stairs at one point, killing him instantly. Gerald was arrested and died in jail, but that's not where his ghost is said to be. Families that have moved into the home since have reported strange things happening inside. First of all, it's said that pets just outright refuse to go into this house. Then there's the story of a contractor who came to work on the house and, and saw a large man with long brown hair carrying a cat by its neck, who then began rushing towards the contractor before vanishing into thin air. Many believe the home to be haunted by Gerald Bettis, AKA the dog boy. Next, we are headed on up to Gary, Indiana, also known as a serial killer's playground. Once a thriving steel town known as the Magic City, Gary kind of fell off after the local industry began to decline in the 1990s due to competition overseas. Eventually, it turned into somewhat of a ghost town with over 10,000 abandoned and decaying houses far beyond repair lining its empty streets. As is with most abandoned places, the town quickly became a hot spot for arsonists vandals, cult gatherings, and even a serial killer by the name of Darren Van. Between 2013 and 2014, Darren ended the lives of seven different women by forcibly restricting their airways, and six of these women he hid throughout various abandoned homes in the town. The bodies remained hidden, and his crimes remained undetected until police found his final victim lifeless in a motel bathroom. To avoid the death penalty, Van made a deal. Instead of pleading guilty to the one killing, the only killing police had evidence to charge him for, he would plead guilty to seven and bring the police to the homes in which the bodies were stashed to prove that he did in fact commit those crimes. He was instead charged with seven concurrent life sentences without parole. Next on the list is Ojai, California and the tale of the Char Man. Just south of Ojai lies Camp Comfort County Park, which is full of urban legends and ghost stories like tons. There's a, the ghost of a horsewoman, a 
headless motorcyclist. There's a vampire skeleton confined in a stone coffin. The list just goes on and on. There's stuff happening at this place. But one of the creepiest urban legends is the one they call Charman. So in 1948, there was a huge fire in the home of a father and his son. They were both horribly burnt before firemen arrived, and it took them a while to get there apparently, because by the time they did get there, the father was dead, and the son had become completely deranged. He'd hung his father by his feet and skinned him. And the story goes that he just went crazy and then decided to do that. He was like, I'm, I'm burnt! I gotta hang my father up and eat his skin. I don't know. I don't know why that was how it goes, but that's apparently how the story goes. He became then this charred, deranged monster and ran off into the woods and started living like Jason Voorhees. He'd come out and attack unsuspecting people. Charman is said to emit a horrible burning smell and only wears bandages over his burnt, peeling skin. Some say he's a ghost. Others say he survived for a while, living on his own in the woods as a deranged psycho, coming out of hiding on occasion to terrorize people. From the Golden to the Lone Star State, it's time to talk about the candy lady who resided in a small Texas town in the early 20th century. While having a candy lady in your area might sound like a pretty sweet deal, it really was the complete opposite for those living in this particular town. In fact, the candy lady is a story that apparently haunts people of Texas to this day. So who the hell is she? Well, she was a woman with a very sinister N.O. It is said that this woman would leave candy on her windowsills each night in an effort to lure young people over to her home. When they got close, she would snatch them up. During this time, many young members of the town were reported missing, and one farmer reported having found rotten teeth strewn along his fields. That is so gross. A sheriff had also been found with his eyes clawed out and his pockets stuffed with candy, and soon after, a young boy was found in a very similar state. If this doesn't tell you, not to take candy from strangers. I really don't know what does. I just, I can't help you then. Now we move on to Ellicott City in Maryland. This town has a very unsettling urban legend, that of the Blink Man of Ilchester Tunnel, also known as the Flickergeist. Ilchester Tunnel is said to be haunted by the vengeful spirit of a homeless man who was hit by an oncoming train in the 1900s. Now, if you feel like it, you can summon Blink Man to haunt you rather easily. All you need to do is head to the tunnel at midnight, of course, it's always midnight, and stare into it for a whole hour. When 1 a.m. hits, it's said that you'll start Start to see the ghostly, tormented face of the Blink Man, and then every time you blink from that moment on, you'll see him creeping closer and closer to you when your eyes are closed. Now, personally, I wouldn't suggest doing this, even without the possibility of being haunted by a disgruntled homeless ghost the rest of your life. Just don't think it's a great idea to stand staring off into a tunnel in the middle of the night on active train tracks. Moving on up and over to Exeter, Rhode Island, home to many of history's New England witches, the first of which was executed in 1647. Fast forward to 1982, let's talk about the pure evil that is the final days of a young woman named Mercy Brown. Was she a witch or was she just educated? Or was she actually a vampire? Well, here's the thing. In her life, Mercy had watched both her mother and sister pass from tuberculosis, the same disease that Mary Mary suffered from leading up to her final day. Due to all the deaths surrounding Mary and the Brown family, the small town of Exeter began to believe that she might have been a witch, or were still a vampire. Why? No clue. What did they do about it? Well, after her burial, they dug her up and burned her heart and her liver to ashes, and then they force-fed those ashes to her surviving brother who died just two months later. If that's not dark enough, it is said that Mercy Brown's ghost still haunts the cemetery in which her decimated grave resides. Next on the list is Tagus, North Dakota. Now, Tagus has long been abandoned. It's a ghost town that once thrived in the 1900s. There's not a whole lot left of it now, just a handful of rundown homes, uh, and of course, a stairway to hell. At one time, there was a Lutheran church in the ghost town. It was burnt down in the early 2000s by hoodlums. The abandoned church was always said to be a real spooky place. Satan worshippers were said to practice dark rituals there. It's said if you stand in the exact spot where the church once stood, you can faintly hear screams coming from the souls that were once damned to hell. Other sights to see at the abandoned town of Tagus include, but are not limited to, a ghost train, which some have seen chugging along the old abandoned train tracks. Love the idea of a ghost train. 
terrifying, ghostly hellhounds, regular old ghosts, and ticked off local residents who may not be too pleased with mass amounts of people descending on the ghost town to catch a glimpse of the paranormal. From the Stairway to Hell in North Dakota to the Gates of Hell in Thornton, Colorado. What's next? Highway to Hell in ACDC? Anyways, the gates are said to be located just off of Riverdale Road, a relatively short road in Thornton. But you know what they say, short road? Big scary mansion containing the gateway to hell. The mansion is said to have gained its entryway status after a man buried his wife, son, and daughters alive on the property. But these were not the first deaths to occur on the lot. In previous years, many people had been killed and strung up around the mansion as well. We are not sure if the madman responsible for all of these deaths was outright trying to summon the devil, but it appears that when you do that much evil in such a short amount of time, it just kind of happens. Along with the decrepit old mansion's gateway status, the ghost man's wife is said to haunt the property as well, along with a pack of ghost dogs. Many people who have attempted to visit the mansion have reported hearing whispers and screams, experiencing car trouble, feeling a chill, and seeing phantom vehicles and disappearing men on the road. Pretty creepy, I would not recommend going there. We're rounding out the list with the town of Cumberland. So this small town in Rhode Island has an urban legend that may have been part of the inspiration for Freddy Krueger in A Nightmare on Elm Street. So campers at Camp Curina Karana, couldn't figure out how to pronounce that. All you Camp Karana campers, let me know in the comments. But uh, people at this camp have told stories for decades, apparently going all the way back to the early 20th century. So the tale of Fingernail Freddy. Freddy was a farmer who lived in a small log cabin with his wife and children. He was a quiet man who kept mostly to himself, but little hoodlums were always running around on his land and messing with his crops. Well, one day Freddy just, he had enough. He decided he was gonna scare these menaces off his property once and for all by filling a shotgun with rock salt and firing at them. This did scare them off, but not for good. When Freddy was out in town, the young vandals returned and burned his house down, with Freddy's family still inside. Freddy returned to find his cabin engulfed in flames and tried to rush in to save his loved ones, getting severely burned in the process. So Freddy ran off into the woods, living a secluded life. But every once in a while, he'd come out to terrorize young boys at Camp Curina, a disfigured monster with a burnt face and incredibly long nails.